Hi everyone and welcome to this latest conversation in our gender data series. Uh, this time we're looking at women's representation in COVID-19 policymaking. I'm Jessica Abrahams, I'm DevEx's Deputy News Editor based in the United Kingdom. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us from wherever you are. Um, this is one of a 10 part series of digital conversations that DevEx is hosting in partnership with Facebook, explore, exploring how we can use data to better support, support women and girls during this COVID-19 crisis. So far, we've looked at gender-based violence, um, mental health, how to support women healthcare workers, and you can follow all those discussions on social media using the hashtags gender data and De DevEx event. So as we've been exploring in this series, women and girls are uniquely affected by this crisis in uh, really a number of ways from the economic knock-on effects to school closures and other issues that are being created by the lockdowns. And in many ways, women are also on the front lines of tackling this crisis. They make up 70% of the global health workforce. But unfortunately, and perhaps uh, unfortunately not so surprisingly, they're not so well represented when it comes to policy making and governance. So what does that lack of inclusion and representation mean for the decisions that are being made? And how can we use data to make sure that the experiences and needs of women and girls are included in policy making? Both around the pandemic response uh, and also in terms of how we start rebuilding afterwards. Those are some of the questions uh, we're going to be discussing today. And I'm joined by a brilliant panel of experts to do that, who will hopefully be appearing on your screens shortly. I'm, uh, I'm joined by Shafer Akore, uh, a development advisor and board member for the Gates Foundation's Goalkeepers Project as well as the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy in Berlin and the She Tank in Abuja. Uh, we're also joined by Joe Hemmings, Senior Director for Impact at Girl Effect, a nonprofit that works to create spaces to empower girls, both online and in the real world. Uh, and we're also joined by Anne Connell, Senior Data Advisor with Equal Measures 2030, which is a group that aims to make sure that advocates and decision makers have the data and evidence they need to guide efforts on gender equality. So. Uh, loads of expertise to share with us today and thanks so much all of you for joining us. Just uh, a little bit of admin before we get started. The event's going to last about an hour, uh, that will include a discussion with our panellists, um, we'll then have a short presentation from Girl Effect that will offer some practical insights into how they've been gathering information about the lives of girls during this, uh, this pandemic. And we'll also leave time for a Q&A at the end. So if you do have any questions for our panelists during the conversation, you can submit them by hitting the Q&A button, which should be appearing at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also use that button to alert a member of our team if you're experiencing any technical issues. So if you can't hear us properly, for example, just let us know via that box and um, we'll try to sort it out for you. Uh, last but not least, we will be sending around a recording of this session as well as a copy of the slides to everybody after the event, so you don't have to worry too much about scribbling down everything as we're talking. So uh, without further ado, I think we can get started. Um, and, and let's start at the beginning. Um, we say that, that women are not adequately represented in policy making for COVID-19, but how much do we actually know about who's making the decisions here and how, how diverse that group of people is? Um, and perhaps you could get us started. Thanks so much. Um, so maybe I think it's helpful to, to talk a little bit about what the landscape of women's political participation and, and leadership looked like pre-COVID. So what we what we already knew, um, and we know that in women in 2020 um, make up just 20% of, of government um, ministers or cabinet level officials, and 24% of parliamentarians. Um, right. So we already know that women are, are underrepresented. Um, so last year, Equal Measures 2030, who, who I work with, um, put out the SDG Gender Index, which is a tool to track 51 indicators of gender equality uh, in 129 countries around the world. Um, and with the index, we really tried to take a broader cut uh, of data on women's participation. So not only look at parliament, um, because of course we know that the parliament is important, but um, we know that there's underrepresentation in all other aspects of policymaking as well. 
So the index actually included four indicators uh, related to women's participation, uh, women in parliament, ministers, um, as well as women in the judiciary and women's participation in climate talks. Uh, and what we found was that no country in the world had a good or excellent score across all four of those indicators related to participation. So again, no country in the world is doing well across all four. So even where we see pockets of progress, you know, some countries are doing quite well uh, due to gender quotas or other policies. Um, so doing quite well on, on representation in parliament, um, very few countries are even doing kind of average across all four indicators. Um, and the indicators on parliaments and ministers uh, were actually among the worst performing indicators in the entire index in every region, um, which was quite remarkable. And there are of course pockets of progress, as I said, it, it's a really sensitive indicator so it, it means it can change quite quite quickly, really, um, when policies are implemented or government commitments are made to women's representation. Um, so we see pockets of progress. You know, Rwanda, Nicaragua, um, other countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America are, are doing quite well um, on some indicators of women's participation. Um, and we've seen other countries make big public commitments, uh, France, Canada, Ethiopia, um, to equal representation in cabinets. Um, but it's really not moving fast enough. Uh, when we did some trend analysis, we found that the progress on the issue, particularly looking at female ministers, has actually slowed down in recent years. And 40 countries have moved backwards since 2001. So I think that's, that's quite a good framing to start off with, that um, yes, there are pockets of progress where women are reaching the highest levels of power, um, but it's not uniform across countries or regions. Um, and some countries are actually backsliding. Uh, and I start with that partly because we, we know that data pretty well. We know quite a bit less uh, right now about women's participation and, and leadership in the public health response to COVID, right? Um, so the picture of gender equality in, in the global health field before COVID was that women held around 25% of senior roles in global health work worldwide. Um, just eight of the 34 WHO executive board positions, um, which you know is obviously quite an issue um, given the UN's all the UN agencies' commitments to gender equality. Um, and all of this despite the fact that roughly 75% of health workers worldwide are women. Um, so what we do know about who's making policy related to COVID, um, again, we don't know a ton, um, but a study of 24 countries that was done by researchers with women in global health found that just 20% of national task forces um, that are tasked with responding to, to COVID at the national level are women. So just 20% of those, those task forces. Um, and here in the US, for example, uh, the president's coronavirus task force consists of 12 men, uh, 11 of whom are white, which is important to, to point out, um, important in the US context. And that's uh, a pattern we see in, in many other countries as well. Um, when we know that COVID disproportionately affects people of color um, and has unique effects on, on women's lives and livelihoods, um, that lack of diversity is, is quite shocking. Um, so the problem is that, that countries are standing up these kind of task forces in, in different ways, um, in different formats, and not all countries make their, their task force membership list public. Um, so we don't know a lot, um, and you know, it's not clear whether we will know that in the future. Um, so maybe up to academic researchers to, to dig into that data later on, um, because right now the, the available information just varies by country, and, and we don't know a lot. Thanks so much, Anne. And, um, and just to, to ask, you said that no country is meet, is ranked good or excellent across those four indicators. What uh, proportion of representation do you consider to be good or excellent? Uh, we consider good or excellent, so that an excellent score would be essentially a parity. So we give it a, a bracket of 45% to 55% um, women in roles in the ministry, um, as well as in, in parliamentary roles. Okay, so below a good rating is slightly well. lower than that. So around 30, 30 to 40 percent would be good. So it's not necessarily a high bar to, no. to beat. Okay, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, so once we've got a kind of general sense that women are, are pretty much underrepresented in um, policy making and governance around the COVID-19 response, um, what are the potential consequences of that? I know that's possibly a huge question to ask, but Schaefer, um, could you be able to have a stab at that one for us, please? Sure, thank you. Um, the, the consequences are hu humongous, you know, I mean, I, I can't even start, but the, I'm going to list them very fast so we have enough time to go through them in detail. I think the most obvious consequence has been the increase of, of gender-based violence, which is as a result of um, the response now not having uh, policies that agenda, that have a gender lens. 
And the gender lens that we're talking about is a very nuanced gender lens that understands intersections. And I insist on intersections every time I speak about gender responsiveness when it comes to COVID, because it is only intersectionality that will allow us to understand um, the various elements or the various states or the various contexts within which women and girls exist in the world, right? So one, we are seeing um, the fact that we don't have policies that include gender or gender responsiveness exacerbating the situation of women and women already have a disadvantaged position within society within communities, within the economic structures, within social structures, all of those. There's places in which women exist and those spaces are not fair or equal or equitable. Um, number two, we are seeing exacerbated cases of um, we are losing gains when it comes to sexual sexual, um, sexual health reproductive rights. Um, so very many women who depend on contraceptive medi medication cannot access that because of lockdowns or curfews or whatever measures that are being used now because governments came up and leaders said, hey, um, there's a very in the air, let's just lock down the countries without a clear understanding of how does this exacerbate positions of women, particularly in Kenya and even in Africa, where a majority of women still struggle with contraception. Um, we are seeing increased cases of defilement of women and girls as well because you are trapped in, the in, a, in a house or in an estate. Um, but in whichever space that you live, right, with an abuser. Um, and last month, there was this very shocking statistic of a county in Kenya where there were 100 and I think 138 um, cases of defilement that were reported within just one month. So if, you, so if you divide that by 30, you know, you get this very shocking numbers of having not less than probably five cases being reported in a day or even more. But even just one case in a day, every single day for a month is still too much of a number or is too high to be counted, right? So you're seeing that happening. And then when you come to the economies and how governments have been talking about, oh, we are going to protect economies, we're going to protect our markets, we are, we are talking about a recovery, we are talking about um, um, recovery strategies and all of that. But without a gender lens, you're seeing that the positions of women who belong in the informal sector, because the economy they were talking about is very much the formal sector, is lacking. So the women in these spaces who depend on either um, you know, um, daily income, um, who depend on working uh, and, and, uh, under a dollar a day, don't get to benefit from these recovery models that they're trying to employ or the recovery strategies that they're trying to employ. These women are literally starving in their homes and going hungry. So what happens with that, right? And then you're seeing unwanted cases of unwanted pregnancies. Um, what happens, especially around um, young girls or teenagers who shouldn't, who shouldn't even be talking about having, you know, to carry children right now? What happens to these, right? And then you're seeing cases of transactional sex coming up in, in spaces, in formal settlements or in populous areas where, you know, there's no access to clean water and we're talking about COVID, wash your hands, have a sanitizer, do this and do that. All of these are additional burdens to women, you know, and these are not women who, you know, can choose between, should I buy food for my children? Children? Should I buy clean water and wash our hands? Should we have sanitizers? So there's so many other, you know, ways in which um, the lack of a gender responsive policy has already exacerbated the position of women. Um, even thinking about the fact that women are the, you know, at the front line, they are the healthcare workers who, who have been championing for and crying out and advocating for safety, um, um, for safety, um, for, for protective clothing and talking about gosh we are going to expose ourselves to this to this virus how do we protect ourselves what are you going to do and knowing that some of them already contracted this virus majority of women have already lost their jobs and knowing how the capitalism market works women will lose their jobs first but will be the last to be hired right so then wondering how is it that at this point when you know Yes, we have a virus. Yes, we have a crisis, but there are other crises that are just festering underneath this global crisis. And that shows you that one, the people who are creating these policies are not listening to women. They don't have um, diversity, of course, because if they did even have some type of women in these spaces, they would see things differently. They would see how to respond differently and how to engage differently. So that's just a short, um, Shocking. I don't want to dampen the mood, but it's the short, shocking facts of what is happening right now. And the fact that we don't have policies that are gender equal, policies that um, you know, that are gender diverse, policies that have um, a gender lens implied to them. So then everybody else is kind of put in this bubble of assuming that they get to suffer or get to go through the same consequences, which is not really the case.
Thanks so much, Shafer. Obviously, um, raised loads of different issues there, and hopefully we'll be able to dig into them, some of those in a bit more detail uh, later. But to start thinking about um, the kind of more practical element to this and, and, and the solutions, um, Joe, coming over to you, what kind of data do we need to start tackling some of these issues, and do we have that data? Uh, thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, I think the two previous participants have, have framed it really nicely in terms of the kind of macro picture of, of the, the kinds of issues that we can track at, at a national level or a regional level and, and those routine indicators that we are absolutely crucial to track over time and over the long term. So I suppose I, I'd quite like to focus on some of the data that as an organisation that's programming directly for adolescent girls that we are kind of uh, taking a sort of bottom up look at. Um, because I think in terms of this being a moment for gender equality, we really need to understand how both the challenges and opportunities related to gender equality look like through the eyes of adolescent girls themselves. I mean, uh, it, it's tough enough for women to be at the table and participating in policy making, but when it comes to children and adolescent girls, it's harder still. Um, obviously, there aren't as many formal opportunities for them to participate. And so you know, I think we feel at Girl Effect that we have a role to play in amplifying, at the very least, amplifying those voices, uh, making sure that their needs are surfaced and also listening to their ideas and solutions as well. Um, and I think while there, what, what we've learned is that while there are some areas where the impact of the epidemic is, we can anticipate it and there's fairly good evidence base for, for the issues that are likely to come up, there are other areas where it's harder to anticipate the impact and we need to generate kind of dynamic data that allows unexpected issues to surface as well. Um, so, for example, we're learning that across the world, in, in quite a consistent way, uh, adolescent girls' mental health is an incredibly important theme. You know, you might, you might think that it might be a taboo issue in some countries, but actually adolescent girls are, are really coming out and talking about this and explaining how they're struggling and also how they're coping and how they're developing coping mechanisms and supporting one another. So that, that's been a really interesting thing that I think we need to understand. And the other thing that's come up that maybe policymakers might not anticipate if you're talking of men in a certain age far removed from uh, these audiences is, is around navigating very complex uh, issues around sexual relationships. Um, and as an organization that um, serves girls with uh, information, guidance, support, inspiration through media, we need to be able to respond to that um, quickly and sort of provide answers, uh, signpost her to services, et cetera. Um, so yeah, really listening to girls and, and what's coming up in their lived reality is really important. And I think, um, you know, policymakers traditionally, their gold standard sources of data for policymaking are around these routine statistics, whether it's um, health information data, uh, censuses, etc. But I think with limited time and resources that most organisations have, and the fact that this is such a fast moving picture, we, we need to be a bit more imaginative in how we generate data um, for policymakers. And I think our best bet at this point is firstly to capture kind of small scale in-depth and ideally participatory research uh, with girls and women, um, moving beyond just the anecdotal, making sure we've got a really robust design for doing that um, and making the case for this being a really valid and crucial source of information for policymakers. Often, often small scale qualitative research is dismissed as being, um, you know, not, not representative, et cetera, but for the moment, you know, we need that quick turnaround that it can give us and we need the stories and the key issues that that can help identify. And then secondly, where possible to complement this with digital and mobile generated data and insights. So um, this can also help identify the issues and tell the story, but it can also help to quantify issues, which we all know policymakers enjoy having, having that grasp on some numbers. Um, so, you know, adolescent girls and women are have more access to phones than ever before. And it's we're learning that it's such a lifeline to them through the pandemic and as well as being a source of information for them it's also a way that we can learn from them um, so at, at girl effect we use a range of digital and mobile channels to talk to our audiences but we're also uh, been developing kind of digital methods to understand audiences as well um, and obviously many more organizations are interested in this now so there's there are a plethora of methods to to gain to generate data with audiences and with populations um, remotely uh, from phone surveys to analyzing comments left on social media um, platforms to you know poll SMS polls all that kind of thing um, we learn a lot from the messages that that adolescent girls send in to us we can identify uh, the issues where they need help and answers um, and it's a very personal and direct way of us generating data with girls um, 
So lots of learning in that sector, I think, but but really promising way to to get data really quickly, really nimbly, and, and make the case for the issues that need addressing. Thanks so much, Joe. So to, to kind of provide um, a concrete example of all these issues that we're talking about for our listeners, I wanted to ask, and, and we've touched on, some of you have touched on this a little bit already, but I, I wanted to ask each of you if you could provide a kind of concrete example that you've seen in your work on this crisis. Um, where a lack of representation of women in policy making has had a, a real impact um, on the policies and it's had a real, uh, real world impact. Uh, or conversely, perhaps even better, a, a really good example um, of, of gender responsive policy making that you've seen. Um, and let's go back to the beginning and start with you. Yeah, I think I'll kind of zoom out and, and make a comment at the more macro level um, that I think there's been, to your second point, about maybe some things we've seen that have been positive. I think there's been a lot made of, or at least in certain circles and media I follow, <laughs> that um, many women leaders in this present crisis seem to be doing better. Um, so countries with female heads of state or government seem to be doing better. And I'm skeptical of that because, you know, I, do we know that women are inherently better at public health response? No. Um, and, you know, they're, they're probably enabling conditions in those countries that allow women to become leaders that, that could be leading to better responses. But I will say, you know, looking at, at Germany, New Zealand, Thailand, uh, Taiwan, uh, among other countries, um, that you do have some pretty good uh, role models for how to effectively guide a country through a public health crisis. And I, I would highlight New Zealand in particular. That I, I think Jacinda Ardern has just been giving the whole world a masterclass and, and how to deal effectively with crisis, to speak directly to citizens and to Joe's point, um, to, to citizens' uh, needs that they've identified themselves, including um, gender specific needs uh, and to consult experts. Um, so I am hopeful that she's changing perceptions around what a strong leader looks like. Thanks very much. Um, Schaefer, let's come to you. Have you seen uh, any examples of this in, in your work? Yes, I, I have fortunately seen a couple of positives um, of what happens when you have women in, in, in policy making and who respond to COVID. What, so two of them that I have actually noticed, one is the provision of essential services. I have seen that when women are able to, to come together, because women are natural organizers, right? Women know how to organize, women have networks, you know, women understand uh, where the pressure points are when they're organizing the immediate needs, and they see that very well. Women basically just see the nuances and how in which they can navigate that. So I've seen that in provision of essential services, like uh, when we talked about food and for um, the Kenyan, within the Kenyan context, and Nairobi, uh, the capital where I live, um, one of the things I noticed were a lot of women within communities that were affected most by COVID, the most vulnerable communities, communities had most uh, poor families that had uh, disabled families and all of those, um, had women organizing around how to get them money because they understood that we cannot just simply go out and buy particular food items and give to these families, lest we be giving them the things they don't need. So the best way to kind of help them be able to do this by themselves and also feel dignified is to give them money. So communities organizing around women and giving money um, and creating this space where we can see that the policymakers actually started noticing that there's a gap, right? As we talk about providing people with essential services, so like food and clean water, but then we also need to talk about how do we give them money, those who've lost jobs and probably won't get their jobs in a while, so they can buy whatever it is that they need, so we're not prescribing upon them what we assume that they need. Another thing that I have seen is, um, uh, which I've also done myself uh, within my workspace, is ensuring the access uh, of sanitary pads, because uh, within our um, education system, our public education system, we have a program where the government is able to distribute sanitary pads to school. But now because schools are closed, the girls who depend on the sanitary pads who are the most vulnerable girls don't have access to this. And we all know periods don't stop for, for pandemics. So we organize with a couple of other uh, service uh, sanitary pad providers within the market and we were able to identify communities where the girls were and how to distribute. So we identified a channel, we identified how many uh, girls are there, which communities are connected to particular organizations and get that distributed. So even just around the sanitary pad access policy and what that looks like, and that can be something that can be done in various other counties. So we ensure that girls you know, don't have to struggle with their menstrual cycle during this period. So two examples that I think um, have shown positively what including uh, women in policy can can really do at this time. 
Thanks so much. So a great spread across the, the macro and the micro examples um, from you two there. And, and Joe, coming to you, any, uh, any cases that you've seen in your work? Thank you. Um, I'll do a quick one, which it's, it's actually not directly related to Girl Effect, but um, there's a story I follow closely, which is a positive example here in the UK, where there was a really rapid move to legalise medical abortion for use at home without a doctor's referral at the beginning of the lockdown. Um, which was it was the result of many years of campaigning, research, advocacy by sexual and reproductive health groups, um, the likes of MSI and many women's rights groups as well. Um, so they had laid the ground that it that it was to argue that it's safe to use at home, but it did take a pandemic to get that policy shift over the line. And even then, it took some pressure from um, women's groups and the WHO. Uh, but I think you know there were enough strong voices and women's voices at the front of that to get that policy shift over the line. Thanks so much, uh, everyone. So I, I want to take the opportunity now to kind of dig in a bit more to some of the issues you've raised already. Um, so Schaefer, coming back to you, one of the things you mentioned is the question of intersectionality. Um, I'm sure most of our listeners would be familiar with that term, although it'd be great if you could just uh, perhaps give a very quick rundown. Um, we do sometimes when it comes to data and policy making talk about women and girls as though they're a homogenous group and they all have the same needs and the same experiences. Um, how can we ensure policymakers are considering the needs of all women and girls during this crisis? Brilliant question. Um, I think intersectionality is a way forward as we think of even, you know, building better recovery and all of that. If we don't see intersectionality, we're going to be in trouble. And I'll start by just briefly explaining what that means. Intersectionality is having um, is having he's having the ability to be able to see that within a particular context uh, context each woman and each girl is living within a reality that is unique to them is living within a moment that is unique to them so you're looking at things like the demographics um, the political um, the political environment the economic environment their education you're looking at their age so understanding those differences is very very important because when you talk about just women and in policy making and you describe women as one homogeneous group without understanding that women are different right their dreams are different their ambitions are different where they live is different their experiences are different how all of that external uh, factors get to affect her decisions the choices they have you know where they live and what they do is very important and that's what intersectionality makes very clear that it makes us be able to understand that as we are making policies and as we are creating policies and even as we intend to implement policies around gender responsiveness policies i mean policies that are able to dignify the lives of women and girls we understand that they even have uh, that women have women and girls have different sexual identities how does this you know how how is this represented within the policy space when we say you don't have access to medical health what happens to uh, a woman who belongs to an lgbtqi community right so the queer community who cannot access um either medical services because you know they they are trapped in a home and they are violently abused you know because we understand that homophobia is still very much alive with us even though it sucks and it should be ended completely how do they get to access medical services how do they get to report when the reporting structure is already homophobic when the people who are supposed to protect them are already homophobic so understanding those levels of um dispositions what we call double marginalization so you're marginalized by being a woman and then you're marginalized even more based on your on your disposition so a woman with uh, with disabilities how does this woman engage at this time of covid so one they probably don't have employment they don't have access to certain um, um they don't have access to income they don't have access to spaces where they can get care or health how do they move so while you're creating policies if you don't see a woman who has um, disability or a woman who's able differently as someone who you should prioritize there's a problem if you don't see a young woman who is just started menstruating and is, you know is underage and is prone to be sexually violated because because of the community she lives in, you're creating policies that don't protect her, there's a problem. If you don't see a single mother, if you don't see a woman who lives alone, who's not married, who's not partnered, if you don't see all these women within their different um, spaces and contexts, that is what intersectionality brings into policy. And without us not being able to see that, we won't understand why there are women who are now struggling as head, head of households. Even though we have an entire narrative that claims that men are the head of households, then what happens to households where women are leading, right? What happens to households where women are the ones taking care of the children, where women are taking care of sick people now, where women are the ones doing unpaid care work. So having an intersectional lens allows us to be able to see all of these different ways in which women are, um, are one, disadvantaged, and then to disadvantage even further what we call now double marginalization. 
I hope that makes it a bit clear, not confusing. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. We are just beginning to run out of time for the discussion. So I just want to ask one more question um, before we move on to the presentation, uh, which is we've talked a lot about um, data and how to gather data and if we have the data. Um, but once we do have it, um, how can we make sure that uh, it's available to policymakers that they're actually using it and considering it? Um, and is that something you might be able to talk to us about? Yeah, sure. So I, I think, um, you know, the short answer is no, it, it's not enough to just have the data. Um, and to Schaefer's really good points there, it's also about what data we have. Um, you know, if we have data that's disaggregated along the lines of, of gender, sex, disability, race, um, you know, and other social factors as well. Um, and this question is really core to what we do at, at Equal Measures 2030, um, that data alone uh, are not particularly useful. It's about data use and, and about creating a culture of data use. So from our standpoint, the, the best, most effective way to create real policy change is to get the data into the hands of gender equality advocates. Um, and by that, I mean policymakers, uh, as well as women's rights organizations working on the ground. Um, and I have a, a quick example that's not COVID related, but I think illustrates this nicely from one of our partners, um, Groots Kenya uh, trained advocates um, to collect data on land ownership and accounting in Kenya. Um, and they found that less than 9% of women were registered members of local ranches. Um, and being a member is the only way to access all the benefits, the economic benefits of, of being part of a ranch in that county. So the advocates used the data to influence them to advocate um, the local ranch chairman and leaders um, to challenge the local policies. Um, and as a result, not only did more women become members, um, but recently in the elections at the local ranch group, uh, four women were elected as part of the leadership of the group. Um, and I like this example because it shows that, you know, we can look a lot at it and talk a lot at, at the national level or the macro level, but a lot of the really good data collection is actually happening at the subnational level. Um, and I, I like this, this example also because it gives this really nice, sorry, we've got a helicopter overhead. <laughs> it gives a, a, an idea of this nice arc uh, of the data life cycle. So from advocates collecting to using it to uncover the scale of an issue uh, and then advocating successfully for change using that data. Um, so it really, I think, gives a nice example of the kind of data life cycle, of what type of data we need. Um, and to Joe's point earlier that, that maybe, especially now after COVID, um, we need to focus more on, on different alternative methods of data collection, whether it's mobile or, or digital generated data um, or smaller scale efforts. Thanks um, so much to all of you for all of those insights so far. I know uh, we're getting uh, lots of questions in and just to remind our audience, if you do have any questions um, for our panelists, you can submit them via the Q&A box. Um, but now for a kind of case study um, about all, the, all of these issues that we're talking about, um, we are joined by Isabel Quilter, who is Senior Manager for Evidence at Girl Effect. Um, and Isabel has very kindly prepared a presentation for us about how um, Girl Effect is gathering data directly from girls and using it to create products and services that meet their needs. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, and I think now would be a great time to have a look at that presentation. Um, thanks very much, Jess. Um, yeah, so I know my name is and I'm a senior evidence manager at Girl Effect and I run the TAKE project, um, which is um, Girl Effect's in-house peer research methodology. Um, so we can start the slides, if that's okay. Okay, um, I can't actually see the slides, but um, I'm just going to assume that they are uh, visible on screen. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about uh, a project that we've been working on at Gerd Effect um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it's called Hear Her Voice, um, and it's a set of digital diaries um, where we asked um, our takers um, to turn the camera on at themselves and discuss with us their experiences of lockdown. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and so um, for those of you that know about Tega, Tega is an in-house peer research methodology where we train uh, networks of young women and adolescent girls to be peer researchers 
based on the hypothesis that um, an adolescent girl um, living in a remote community is much more likely to give uh, candid insights about her life and the things that are important to her to another girl that's just like her. So that's why we've employed this peer research methodology um, to talk to girls and inform girl effects work and also the work of other development and humanitarian actors. Um, and so with the, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, traditional uh, modes of data collection have become very difficult and we've had to turn to remote methods. And also a lot of our TAGA work has been paused because it's a face-to-face -face peer research methodology uh, normally. Uh, and so we were looking for a way to find out what's really going on for women and girls during the pandemic. Um, and we had the idea that we could turn, ask the takers to turn the camera on themselves. And we thought that this would be a really cost effective, really agile, and also crucially a really safe method of gathering really rich data from girls about what's important to them and what their experiences are like of lockdown and the pandemic more generally. Uh, and so this is how uh, we came up with the idea of the COVID-19 diaries um, or the Hear Her Voice project. And really the idea is to gather insights from girls and then just get them out there in the world so that they can be heard. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so the design is really simple. Uh, we asked 25 of our tagers uh, who are based in five countries across three continents. So we have tagers reporting from India, Bangladesh, Malawi, Nigeria and the United States. And over six weeks, they submitted a diary to us um, every weekend. So we have six rounds of data collection and we sent them a really simple survey to find out what was going on with them. Um, so the questions that we asked them, they were mostly open questions, so they could discuss whatever they wanted, but we sort of steered them towards talking about uh, the effect on their livelihoods, um, their coping strategies during the pandemic, um, their awareness of COVID-19 and its prevention methods, um, and their emotional, well emotional and um, mental health during the pandemic. Um, and then they return the data to us via their mobile um, and it's all safely encrypted. And then we translate the data and we're in the process of uploading it into a mobile site for sharing. So um, I'm just gonna show you a really short video which gives you a bit of an idea of the project that we've produced. Uh, next slide, please. Hello, and namaste. Asalaamu Alaikum. And today the pandemic is making me feel alone. Thank you. So that video just kind of introduces you to our 25 tagers um, in their really different locations. Um, and the thing that was really important to us with project, this project is that we didn't want it to feel extractive and we didn't want the tagers to feel under pressure to participate because we pay them for the work that we do. Uh, and so we carried out all the usual risk assessments and safeguarding procedures that we normally would um, and paid particular attention to the risks during COVID to make sure that, the, that everything is safe and the tagers feel adequately supported. Uh, we also tried to co-produce the study um, with the tagers. So we checked in with them regularly. Uh, we asked them um, to feed in to our design. So we asked them what questions we should be asking them to make sure that we aren't making any assumptions about um, what's going on with them or the things that are important. Um, we asked for their feed in at several times during the project. Uh, we also asked them to ask questions of other tagers so they could um, understand what was happening in other geographies. And we also asked them to offer their advice to other girls for what life hacks they could offer um, for surviving lockdown in really cramped conditions uh, with their families. We also tried to mix up positive and negative questioning because we didn't want the takers to feel like we just wanted to hear about the really hard things that are happening during the pandemic. We also wanted to hear about what hobbies have you been working on? Which family member are you getting on with best? Um, and um, what have you been working on at the moment in terms of gardening or embroidery or reading or education? Um, next slide, please. Um, so this slide is gonna show um, one of the outputs from this diary. So this is a diary from um, Janet in Bangladesh, uh, and she's just gonna give us a rundown of her experience of the pandemic. 
মহামারীটি আমার জীবনের সবচেয়ে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বিষয়ের উপর প্রভাব ফেলেছে আমার পড়াশোনা এবং আমার ব্যক্তিগত কাজের ক্ষেত্রে আমার পড়াশোনা এভাবে প্রভাব ফেলেছে কেননা আমরা সবসময় আতঙ্কে আছি ভয়ে আছি আসলে আমাদের কখন কার মাঝে এই ভাইরাসটি প্রবেশ করে যার ফলে আমরা আমাদের পড়াশোনায় মন বসাতে পারতেছি না এর ফলে আমার যে কাজের উপর প্রভাব ফেলেছে আমি একটি প্রাইভেট প্রতিষ্ঠানে কাজ করতাম যেখানে অফ হয়ে মানে বন্ধ হয়ে দিয়েছে তো এখানে আমি কাজ করে যে অর্থটা পেতাম সেটা দিয়ে আমার ভালোই কাটতো কিন্তু বর্তমানে আমার প্রাইভেট প্রতিষ্ঠানটি বন্ধ হওয়ার ফলে আমি আর সেখানে কাজ করতে পারতেছি না ফলে আমার যে মাসিক ইনকামটা হতো সেটাও বন্ধ হয়ে গেছে এই মহামারীতে আমি আমার বাসায় সবার সাথে সময় কাটাতে পারতেছি অনেক ভালোভাবে যেমন আমি বেশিরভাগ সময়ে যেভাবে কাটাই আমার ছোট ভাই বোন রয়েছে তাদের সাথে এছাড়া আমার দুইটে ভাই রয়েছে আমার নিজের ভাই একজন আমার মামাতো ভাই যাদেরকে আমি পড়াশোনা করাই তাদেরকে পড়াচ্ছি আমার দুই মামাতো বোনকে সময় দিতেছি এবং এর পাশাপাশি আমি হাতের কাজ শিখতেছি এবং রান্নার কাজে আমার মাকে সাহায্য করতেছি এভাবে আমার দিন আসলে আমার সময় কাটাতে লাগতেছে even in one minute janat tells us so much about what she's experiencing like we immediately know what's happening with her livelihood what's happened to her working life as well as her education her school has stopped who she locked down with who she currently living with um we also learn a bit about how she's passing her time and so even just with these 25 takers across 6 weeks we ask them maybe between 6 and 8 questions a week uh we have an incredibly rich data set from girls in such diverse locations telling us in a really candid way about what's going on for them um so when it came to looking at the key findings for this project and figuring out what was coming out we were quite surprised about the how many commonalities there were between these different locations um and i think as the previous session showed there's some kind of fairly predictable thematics in terms of what's going on for girls in this sort of situation so we know that their livelihoods um are really severely affected uh, and therefore um their nutrition is affected um and their choice their food choices um have been compromised we also know that mostly their education has stopped unless they have access to online school and also there's challenges in terms of shr services um so girls told us a lot about how they're coping with menstruation during this time what they've been hearing about how girls are um handling relationships with their boyfriends handling relationships with their friends how they're feeling in terms of isolation there's so much in there uh next slide please mohamarti amar jiboner shob um so i tried to boil it down into key findings which is quite difficult because it is such a rich data set um but a really key thing that came out for us was um how important a mobile phone can be for a girl during this time so it's worth pointing out that we loan the takers a, sm a basic smartphone when they join the program but then they keep this phone in their house and so they often use it for other things and all of the takers um have pointed out that a smartphone with internet access or an internet enabled feature phone is so important to them during lockdown because this phone is a source of information about covid they've talked about how they've looked for reliable information about um the symptoms of covid that and the prevention of covid also it keeps them connected um to friends which helps with isolation and also it can help them learn so if these girls can get online to do online school or educate themselves um that's really really valuable although we also consistently heard that not being able to afford data or leave the house to get data was a problem next slide please um again fairly predictably a lot of livelihoods um is a big issue for these girls and the anxiety linked to this um loss of um earnings was very significant and something that we saw with all the takers um and so this kind of anxiety mixed with other um issues that were concerning them um fear of covid etc um and also there was more practical effects of this like to try and work during lockdown um and obviously an effect on food and supplies and a difficulty in things and getting water etc uh, next slide please so um schools and colleges
restriction on their ability to take the exams that they need to take. Uh, and a lot of them were worried about um, being able to access the jobs they wanted. And this could have knock on effects for things like early marriage uh, and a lack of ability to support their families. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the fourth and final finding um, is around poor mental health. Um, and so we found this to be also very prevalent amongst the girls. And they talked a lot about the effects of isolation, the uncertainty of the situation and their fears of catching COVID or those around them catching COVID. They were effect they're affected by a lot of rumours and stigma um, around um, the pandemic and what they were hearing in their... Um, in the community and the anxiety and emotional stress was very significant but takers did also tell us about how they've been finding ways to cope and that included connecting themselves with their phones with games and other hobbies next slide please So what are we going to do with all this data? Well um, our first aim is really just to get it out there so we've created sites which I believe will be going online tomorrow where you can go online and look at the data um, in terms of countries or in terms of specific takers and follow their story. And it's really just a simple website where we can view a video and view a quotation. It's, and then there's some articles written by us drawing together some of the themes. Um, and from there, we've used this data to influence Girl Effects COVID-19 response and that of our partners. So I guess a practical example of that would be, we've been working with our Charja team in India, India's um, Charja's Girl Effects uh, digital brand in India. And, and Charja has been creating con content based on these findings, which seeks to keep girls motivated around their education during lockdown, seeks to help them um, track their periods. They know when they need to try and get sanitary pads, um, keeps them occupied uh, with fun and interesting content. Um, and also provides advice on safe digital literacy if they're doing things like communicating with boyfriends via mobile phone, how to do that in a safe way. Um, and then from there, we're hoping to create some policy recommendations, which we hope to share with the sector really widely. And I encourage anyone who's watching this um, presentation who's interested in this project and feels like these findings could be helpful to them to get in touch with us to talk about how we can use these findings as widely as possible. Because these findings are so rich and there's so much in there, um, I feel like there's, there's information in here which is really relevant to Girl Effect, but there's also so much about education, social isolation, livelihoods, et cetera, which other organizations could use. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and that's it. Um, any questions, let me know. Great, thanks so much, Isabel. Um, it's really great to have a really practical example there, um, especially of how to gather information from girls uh, right now. I should be coming back into your screens now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exa especially of how to gather information from girls right now when there are so many challenges to this. So I'm sure that's been really helpful. Um, we have just 10 minutes left um, for some questions from the audience. Um, so it'd be great if we can get all of the panelists back on the screen. But I'm going to start actually with um, uh, a question for you, Isabel, about um, the presentation. Uh, somebody asks, uh, what kind of risk assessments were conducted before engaging the Tagers in their participation, and particularly any methods or lenses of analysis that you use to reflect the current COVID context? And could you also explain a little bit more about the technology used for the digital diaries? Yeah. Um, so in terms of risk assessments, we essentially we take safeguarding extremely seriously at Girl Effect and really usually before we do a research project we scope out services so if someone does make a safeguarding disclosure they can be referred to a service. Obviously during COVID-19 a lot of things have closed down and also we, we questioned what could happen if one of the takers or one of their families contracted COVID so we had to do a kind of scoping exercise to see what was available in their local areas and open and think of new ways to refer girls um, to places of help if something happened and also conducted risk assessments around what data to conduct their survey do they have to go outside and just mitigations in place to make sure they're kept safe i mean the takers are reporting from their homes 
So um, in theory, they're safe, but also as we know, girls are just as at risk at home as out in the community potentially. So we were also checking in with them regularly to make sure that they were safe and not there was no risks in their home. Um, in terms of the technology that we use, um, each of the girls has a really simple smartphone and it houses an app that we've developed where I can write surveys um, or any of the teams in, in our local context can write surveys and just ping them to the, to the takers phones and they open the app and then they can see the questions and respond via video, um, photograph or also multiple choice coded questions uh, and then sync their device and the data comes back to a, a bespoke kind of database where we can analyze and view the videos and the data um, and that's it really um, yeah it's fairly simple but um, we've been using it for face-to-face -face research and girls filming other girls and so it just made sense to have them self-reporting in a kind of selfie mode and would you be able to explain just very quickly and um, how the 25 girls were selected yeah um so firstly, based on willingness and enthusiasm for the project. Um, and also we tried to select takers who were confident in speaking and um, were really good at using their phones and aware of things like framing and lighting and trying to find a quiet place, which can be very difficult when you're locked down with your family in a cramped location. Um, but the key thing really was that they really wanted to take part. Um, and, and we have a variety of other selfie tasks going on at the moment uh, as, a, as a mode of remote research. So for those who didn't take part in this study, we've made sure that there's other opportunities for them to do other studies. Um, so nobody feels left out, I guess. Great, thanks so much. Before I move to the next question, I just wanted to mention um, that an audience member has told us that the CARE International has a new report out today showing that countries with higher levels of women's leadership are more likely to be implementing responses to COVID-19 that support gender equality. So really just um, some evidence to support um, what all of our panelists were talking about earlier. Um, to move on to the next question, there's one for you, Schaefer. Um, an audience member asks, how can grassroots organisations collect data at our level of working, for example, in an informal settlement that a person such as yourself could use for advocacy and policy making? Good question. I think um, there are I think there are a couple of things that can be done. One is using um, what we are calling um, mobile generated data because now that everybody's at home and you're practicing social distancing and um, we don't have access to you know, physical, con you know, physical meetup spaces, we can do uh, data um, that is collected through mobile. I think that can really work for grassroots. Um, we can also do, I think they can also do, um, but very deeply monitored, I think also around the COVID measures, very deeply monitored um, small groups and hold small groups but i don't know how that would really work especially during these times when you have all these measures that we have to keep so that's why i go back to mobile data um, collection the thing about mobile data for me is how do we make sure we are anonymizing data for safety and security as well because we understand the risks around data that is collected on the phone or via phone um, and the fact that a lot more of this data is sensitive um, a lot more of this data can risk the lives of the people a lot more of this data can expose even the girls and i love what what uh, the, the last speaker was just presenting on how they collected this information from the girls without you know feeling like it's um, an extractive process or making it feel like they're going to you know they're exposing them to risks so anonymizing data and, and understanding that this data that they're collecting is risk um, risk averse as much as possible that it can be used the thing for me about data now is not because I also realize that a lot of people are trying to collect data to prove the problem of gender imbalance or gender um, non-responsiveness of COVID which I think would be a waste of time and resources and skills when we already have so much going on so I'm, I'm really pushing towards people who are collecting data that helps you know to to measure the extent um, to show what is happening and then to use this data um, in ways in which does not that mystifies the top-down approach so you know that that is able to also access spaces where policy is being created and policies being formulated 
I think is very important. And then lastly, um, I think to involve grassroots um, organizations or community voices, it also demands that uh, policy spaces or spaces that are doing the gender work uh, open up to be able to disintegrate themselves and get to the root cause and get to the people who really need them so that they don't just formulate this data, data at high level and then forget that they're people who are actually involved. So, you know, understanding that data is about people. So actually talk to people, engage people, make people part of your process to humanize and validate your, your findings. Thank you so much. Uh, and then I guess tying um, some of this together, um, we have a question about how nonprofits that don't necessarily have gender um, as their main mission um, can partner with other organisations to make sure that they're still putting gender at the core of their work um, and advancing gender equality goals. Um, would anybody like to, to, to pick up that question? I can go very fast and then open it to someone else. Um, I think, I think first of all, organizations that assume, and I think it's an assumption, assume that they can't do gender work or that they're not doing gender work, so they're not involved in the gender discourse, is a false assumption. One, because gender is very intersectional and that gender is everything and touches everything. Even if you look at the SDGs from one to the 17, you realize that women are always, uh, women and girls are always uh, uh, disadvantaged within, you know, when you're talking about poverty, you're talking about education, you're talking about water sanitation, economic growth, environment, there's always an element of gender. Gender. So first, I think it's demystifying the whole conversation that gender belongs to organizations that are doing gender work, or that gender belongs to women, because we have female bodies and go through female experiences, and then demystifying the fact that gender belongs to institutions or to funders that work within this space and making gender a collaborative um, effort. That is what I wanted to say, so someone else can add something else. Great, thanks so much. Did anybody want to add anything to that? I'll chime in. I think, um, you know, on kind of two ends of the thinking about the data life cycle, I think um, talking about the private sector, I think there are many places where the private sector can come in. And there's a lot of rhetoric around uh, private sector companies wanting to, to do more on gender data. Um, again, keeping in mind uh, all of the safeguarding that we need to keep in mind mind when we're talking about gender disaggregate data, but that some, you know, private sector companies already collect data that would be really useful for, for gender equality advocates. Um, for example, in the, the ICT space, so on internet and technology um, or utility use. So some of that data could be really useful to gender equality advocates, um, but isn't publicly accessible right now. And at the other end, um, you know, we've, we've worked with uh, Tableau on our data visualizations and companies like that can really do a lot, um, not only for an organization like us, but also maybe for more grassroots organizations to amplify their voices and, and do more with the data that, that grassroots groups already have. Um, so thinking about kind of different ways that the private sector companies or other organizations lend the resources they have, um, I think there's a lot, a lot to do in that space. And especially now as we're, we're thinking about how this crisis has really highlighted the need for, for better and more publicly accessible um, disaggregated data. Um, I think there are places where we're, uh, you know, you, kind of non-traditional actors or, or organizations that don't typically work on gender can, can come in and get involved. Um, I, guess, I guess just the final thing I would add is just that, I mean, I know that when you start for organizations who might start working in this space that people might be a little afraid that they say the wrong thing or something that's politically incorrect or they don't know where to start. And I, I just, there are so many amazing resources out there online where, where people can do some self-directed learning, um, tools to help you do a gender analysis, all that kind of thing. So I think, you know, look, look, look for some credible sources uh, of, of information to help you approach that, that, if that's something new to you, to help approach that. And then I, I do think reaching out to organizations working in this space, they, they tend to be pretty willing for people who have an open mind and want to learn. Um, I think people are generally very open to having a conversation, to helping people learn, direct them to more resources and so on. So uh, just, I guess, don't, don't, don't be afraid to put a foot wrong. It's much better to approach it with an open mind and, and learn. Thanks so much everyone for all of those uh, answers. We have unfortunately run out of time. So just very quickly before we wrap up uh, in perhaps 30 seconds each, um, what I'd like to ask each of you what the key thing is that you'd like the audience to take away from this conversation. Um, Joe, would you be able to kick off maybe? Um, yeah, I suppose the key thing is that we shouldn't we shouldn't assume what the impacts on on gender equality are going to be. We should 
really dive in deep and listen to what's going on um, and, and create solutions um, in partnership with the people that we're working with to, to make sure that we get to the right place. That's a really interesting point. Thank you. Um, Anne? Yeah, I would say that um, I do think the, the COVID-19 crisis, as well as the mass peaceful protests we're seeing now around the world, um, you know, I'm hopeful that they might change norms and perceptions of what strong leadership looks like. Um, and I think, you know, both both uh, have really highlighted the need for more disaggregated data because it makes it really difficult to, to advocate for change um, or to take specific action on discrimination and inequality if we don't have um, data on gender, race, ethnicity and other, other social factors. And Shafer? Um, I think three things very importantly, um, funding, funding women of the organizations, the organizations that intend to do gender work, their work is very vital and needed right now, forming new partnerships out of just the gender space, so bringing in new voices, new angles, you know, new information, I think is really important, and number three, making policy spaces accessible to women and making policy um, that is not top-down approach, but is bottom-up approach. Thanks so much, everyone. Unfortunately, that is all we've got time for, but it has been a really fascinating discussion. Um, I know we've had loads of questions in from the audience, so hopefully we've provided some um, useful insights for all of you at home. Uh, and thanks to all of our panelists, of course, um, for all of your expertise today. And, and thanks to everybody who tuned in to listen as well. Um, we will be sharing a recording of the event as well as a copy of Isabel's slides with you all by email. Um, if you found this event useful, do make sure to sign up for the next one, which is on June 23rd, when we'll be looking at how to support refugee women during this time. And uh, of course, you can join the conversation online using the hashtag gender data. Uh, until then, make sure to stay safe and well wherever you are. All the best from all of us on the panel uh, and all the best from all of us at DevX as well. Thanks so much. <laughs>